Sulphur Christian Church on this fine June. We're in June, and it actually feels like summer out there. It feels a little like summer in here. Uh, it feels good. It feels pretty good, though. I'm very, very thankful. Thankful that we're here. Thankful that you're here. Thankful that you're joining us here uh, on Facebook or YouTube, however you catch us uh, each week. Uh, we're just so blessed and so thankful uh, that you're here and that uh, God abides with us. He's here too. And that's good for us to remember and to know and have that comfort to know that he's here with us. Um, any announcements? Not much. Backpack program's kind of uh, in summer mode right now. So uh, we, we need to keep that in mind. It, still, if you see something that has a long uh, date on it and you see a good deal, grab that and go ahead and bring it in and we'll be ready for August. will be here before we know it. So, and the kids will be coming back to school. So we'll, we can get ready for that. Miss Pam? I do have a, a question I asked or I mentioned it to David downstairs. The gentleman who sealed the driveway uh, is coming a couple weeks to do my driveway again and he was wondering if the church wanted it done again it's been a couple of years um so if we do i don't know how we need to say we do if everybody needs to say yes go ahead and do it or what but uh and also david and i talked about maybe asking him to stripe it this time what do you all think about striping it be uh, one. parking uh -huh. yeah it would be yeah um anyway I can let him know in a couple of weeks if some you know everybody gets back to me and lets me know mm -hmm. what the church wants to do. That because he wants to go ahead and get us on his schedule. Okay. Well, we can go out. I thought it's still looking pretty good. So I don't know. Somebody it it does look pretty good, but then once when it gets ready to go, it just goes, you know. And so yeah. Somebody moved a handicap. Well, it broke off. Well, it, I think it, it broke. Rotted and fell over. Or the kids playing beyond, or the or the kids that play basketball out there might have anyway, bumped, so bumped it. Know. But it's okay. Somebody yeah, it's out know. there. We can fix that. That's a that's something we can take care okay. of for sure. So yeah, we'll discuss that. Um, you know, I've always thought it might be a benefit to strike the parking lot. You know, uh, mostly like when we've had weddings or other things like that that seems to be the time when it would be most beneficial because for us who come every week we park in the same place every, every week it's not an issue but when you have guests or you have people and they're going where the heck do i park so you know that that's something that maybe we can we can discuss uh and uh just and let them know as soon as you can so okay because that's this coming week uh, he he the day he's coming to my house is just tentative, but at the, the, I talked to him probably two weeks ago, and he said so at least be two any time. Weeks before okay, we so him. anytime. All right, sounds good. So we can get that process going and talk about that. Um, all right. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we're just thankful that you have us here. You've open the door to us again once more to come in and be close to you together as a body, as a body of Christ. You're, you're always with us everywhere we go, but there's just something special about when we meet together and we're all together, when we worship together and pray together, Father God. It's just a, it's just a special feeling. It's a special thing that you've given us when you give us the opportunity to come together and worship you. Lord Jesus, and there's so much power in it. Father God, all the things that you give us the ability to do, and Lord, we're just so thankful for you. Lord, we praise you and trust that you're here, right here in this place with us. We love you so much. In your precious name we pray, amen. So, three weeks ago, I unknowingly, unknowingly, started a sermon series, but God knew, okay? So a lot of times when I'm praying and I'm thinking about sermon material uh, and what God wants me to speak about, sometimes right away, I mean, I might be driving down the road on the way to work or back and, and it just kind of comes over me. 
what, what we need to talk about or in a conversation with someone and someone will say something that'll really touch my heart and I'll feel like maybe God wants me to speak about that. And so, you know, if you've ever wondered how do pastors come up with what they're going to speak about, I, I, I trust that all or at least a huge majority of people who write sermons do it because they've been inspired by God to do so, that God has spoken directly to them about what they want us to speak about. Now, sometimes it's, you know, you just feel in your heart it's a one-off kind of thing. You know, okay, we're going to talk about baptism this week. And then next week it might be something else. And as you know, sometimes it's more of a series. Maybe, maybe it's more uh, information than it can be covered in one service. So you spread it out over two or three services. And, and so I had no plan, <laughs> no plan for a sermon series, although I enjoy doing sermon series. And I've done many, many here over the years. This was not one of them. I knew three weeks ago, two Sundays ago, that I was supposed to talk about Jesus walking on the water and and us having the faith to get out of the boat. Then last week, I knew and studied and researched and wrote uh, down about we need to be like ch children, have a childlike faith. And when we talked about the passage when Jesus said, Oh, let the, let the children come to me. Well, in the midst of that, last Sunday, while I'm actually in the sermon, there's an aha moment. Jesus is teaching us to come to him. What did he say to, to Peter when Peter was in the boat? Come to me. Come out on the water and come to me. What did he say to the, to the disciples about the little children? Let them come to me. So I knew. And then this today's sermon and e even Wednesday nights all came together. And it's just a, a really, really cool thing to see God work. And that's how you know it's not you. Because I think that's really important as a pastor, as a minister, as a preacher, is that you know, you could fall under the temptation to sh share what you think is your own thoughts, what is your own wisdom. And God goes, you know, it's, it's not about you, brother. <laughs> it's not about you. you, you not, it's not about the preacher. It's not about the teacher. It's not about who's speaking. It's about who we're speaking about. And so I just wanted to share that with you today that even after over 10 years of being here, I am honored and humbled by the fact that God takes little old me and uses me. And I'm just very, very thankful for that. And I wanted to share that today that, uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes the whole preaching thing, and even when preachers get together, sometimes it's, it seems a little bit too much like academia to me. So, uh, we're very blessed in this area to have some excellent preachers who are very humble and have good wisdom and that they're pure in their sharing of the gospel, you know, and, and I, I'm blessed to have other and fellow pastors near and around me that, that feel the same way I do. I, it's, it's not me. It is all God. So I just wanted to say that and that I'm very thankful for that. So today we're doing Come to Me Part 3, okay? The sermon series that wasn't a few weeks ago is today. I know. So um, we're going to start out in Matthew 11, verse 28 and 30. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. So this, this, the, this verse actually has been on my heart for several weeks. And, um, you know, one thing that is true when you're a, you're a pastor, when you're a preacher, when people find out you're in ministry is you, you hear 
a lot about what troubles people have, the burdens that people carry. Um, everywhere you go, even when you meet new people and you bump into people, you know, a lot of times when they find out what your vocation is, what you do, what your calling is, uh, a lot of times you, you hear about um, burdens, you hear about the bad things going on in their lives. And so th this scripture's actually been on my heart for several weeks. Also, I totally, completely believe that it was because Jesus was prepping me already for a sermon series that I knew nothing about, but he knew everything about. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Amen. Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest in your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So like I was saying three weeks ago, started a sermon series I knew nothing about called Come to Me. I was unaware of this until really this past week. Uh, in the Kind of in the middle of the sermon last week, just an aha moment, it was really, really kind of unsettling in the middle of the sermon, I'm going, oh yeah, ta-da, okay, got it, all those, all those things. But we learned two weeks ago, we talked about Peter being called by Jesus to come out on the water, and we learned that getting closer to Jesus often involves getting out of the boat. We get in our little boats, we get in our little shells, we get in our little places and, and we find comfort there and security. Well, that's not always what the Christian life is about. In fact, once we are saved, saved, we have gain our salvation, really the Christian life is about getting out of one boat, walking on the water with Jesus for the walk for a while and getting out of another boat walking on the water with Jesus for a while and getting out of another boat. We all have several places in our lives where we find comfort and security, but the truth is a lot of times that comfort and security is false. It's contentment rather than security. And then we have to get out and start walking on the water with Jesus. We have to get out from our and over our fears. We have to understand that Jesus is going to walk beside of us on the water and keep us safe, even though, in a lot of ways, maybe we're still contending with sins that we've had all our lives or all our adult lives. And it's okay. What we need to understand is Jesus wants to walk with us until we're willing to give those things up. He wants to. We feel guilty about it. We don't like it. We hide it. We keep things secret. There are things in our lives that we hide from the world, maybe even those we love the most, and we keep secret inside of us, hoping and praying that someday God will take those from us. And typically, a lot of times, he's trying to take those from us, but we're just not quite ready or willing to do that. But what we do need to understand is that God wants to continue walking with us as he walks on the water with us. And then last week, we talked about Jesus letting the little children come to him and that we have to learn or relearn how to have that childlike faith. Just to take God at his word. Just to trust it. We don't really have to analyze every little detail of what God says in his word. And we, we do that. 
we try sometimes to overanalyze. Instead of just taking God at his word like a child, when, when you tell a child it's going to be okay, typically that child will go, okay. God wants us to be that way. When God tells us it's going to be okay, he wants us to just believe it. So today I'd like to talk about how Jesus continues to call us to come to him where he continues to say, come to me. You see, this is an overriding theme throughout the Bible. He wants us to come to him, to get closer and closer. And right here in this passage, there's a lot more to it than just getting closer to him. And we're gonna explore that this morning. Probably all of us, every single one of us, have had those times, those seasons in our life when we feel exactly the way Jesus is talking in this passage, weary, burdened, anxious, depressed, all those feelings that we have sometimes, worn out, times when we forget to go to God, and we do. Sometimes we forget to go to God. And when we do forget to go to God, we find ourselves getting stuck in a rut of being sick and tired all the time. Isn't that true? You ever notice that? When you start getting into that mindset, oh, I'm so tired, so tired. I'm just, I'm tired of being sick. I'm sick of being tired. I'm sick and tired all the time. You, 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 you find yourselves falling into that rut. I'm just so tired. I'm tired of the world. I'm tired of work. I'm tired of school. I'm tired of relationships. I'm tired of, of bills. I'm tired of being sick. I'm tired of being hurt. I'm tired of being lonely. I'm tired of being surrounded by people. It, it is a place that we can find ourselves in very, very quickly. And we have to be very, very careful and understand that if, if we go to God when we first start having those feelings, we can save ourselves a lot of time and trouble by going to God first. When God says, come to me, you know what he's really saying? He's saying, come to me before you get to that bad place you find yourself before you find yourselves back in the shadows, come to me. Come to me now. Come to me right now, please. It's very important that we try to do that. I think we can all agree that there are times when we forget that God is, listen to this, God is our source of rest. God is our source of peace. Turning to him first will save us a lot of time and trouble. So in many ways, our world has tried to make us feel guilty about rest. You know, it's, it's an odd thing. You, you have those, those people that either are sick and tired all the time and all they want to do is rest. You know, w one of the signs of depression is wanting to sleep all the time, wanting to lay up in the bed all the time. That, that is a symptom of depression. But the world tries to make us feel guilty about how we feel. And that's not right. We shouldn't try to tell people that they're bad people because of the way they feel. But what we do need to tell people is that there is a place you can go. There's a entity, a God that you can talk to, someone that will be with you always. We can tell people that, and we can be there for people. And we can try to help people the best we can. 
But when we're talking about we're talking about needing rest, we're not talking about laziness. That's something altogether different. No, I'm talking about getting rest and peace from God. We need to be talking about and telling people about how you can get rest and peace from God. When God tells us to be quiet and listen for his still small voice, he is asking us to rest and spend time with him. When he says, be quiet and, and listen for my still, small, quiet voice, what Jesus is really saying is let's spend time together. I want to teach you. Let's rest together. Let's learn together. This is the time that we will find that we're closest to him, but it's also the time that we'll find that we learn the most from him. In that, those still quiet times, when we do that, when we get close to him and we just listen to him and we're just quiet. There's a reason though why they say we have to take time to do something, right? You understand that. We're busy people. We have things to do. So sometimes we have to take time. We have to take time to be quiet. We have to take time to listen to him and to spend time with him, to come to him. This passage also makes it clear that being close to Jesus is how we can find rest in our souls. Now, you can have the best marriage in the world. You can have the best BFF in the world, the best best friend. You can have an incredible support network of family and friends and coworkers. You can be surrounded by the greatest people in the world that make you feel really, really good about yourself. You can have that, and maybe some of you do have that. But only Jesus and only being close to him is how you can find rest in your soul. It's one thing to get physical rest from our day-to-day -day lives. But, you know, you come home from work, you're tired, you want to rest, you, you rest a little bit. We sleep at night, or some of us do. Some, some don't sleep very good at night. But we, ha we have time, we take time. We do take time to rest. We need to make sure we take time to spend time with God too. But we take time to get physical rest from our lives, from our jobs, from our kids and from life. But it's another thing entirely to get rest for our souls. Something entirely different. The tension, mental fatigue, stress, worry. You see, Jesus calls us to come to him because he wants to give us something that no one and nothing else in this world can give us. And that's rest for our souls. You see, rest is so important for us to function in this world. We need rest. We have to have rest. A lot of us go through periods of our lives where we try not getting rest so we can get more stuff done. And it's always a train wreck, ultimately. Ultimately, you end up physically sick, weary, and burdened. Amazing how that works, right? Rest is important. He needs to have us be ready. We need to get plenty of rest. Why? Because he needs us to be his hands and feet. We need to be physically, mentally, and spiritually ready to do the work that he's called us to do. And that's to love people. And that's to tell people about God and what he does for us. So what does Jesus mean when he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in spirit and you will find rest in your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Anybody in here know what a yoke is? I'm not talking about egg yolk. 
What, what's a yoke? Anybody have a definition for me? It's the harness that connects two oxen together. Yeah, connects. It's a, it's a beam or a device that's used to connect two things together uh, so that they can work together. And it's a lot less work. Also, it can control speed and direction, how fast, how slow, the quality of the work. Okay? So he says here, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. So a yoke is a device used to allow someone to direct and lead something in a task, like steering a work animal, for example, when you're, you're plowing a field. That's exactly right. But Jesus is telling us here that if we keep trying to do life all by ourselves and alone, we're just going to get tired. We're just going to become weary. We're just going to be feel burdened and exhausted. We will just wonder why we're so exhausted and never get to where we want to go or where we need to go. If we don't allow him to put the yoke on us, and you know what? A lot of us are hard-headed. A lot of us are stu stu uh, stubborn, right? We don't want to be steered anywhere. <laughs> we don't want to be led anywhere because we think that we're strong enough that we think we're smart enough, we think we're motivated enough to get to where we need to go and what we need to do. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. And, you know, also when we think of a yoke, we think of hard work, don't we? I mean, we think of being out in the field in June, you plowing a field in June, out there working, and it's hard, and you think those work animals, oh man, those poor things, those poor things. But the, see, that's not true. Uh, you know, if, if animals could talk, they'd say, no, nah, man, I'd rather have Louie on my right over there and, and we're, we're working together. And then Farmer Brown's behind us, not letting us go too fast. We're not going too slow. It's so much easier with that help. That's where we need to find ourselves and how we deal in our lives with God. Remember, remember that uh, Carrie Underwood song, Jesus Take the Wheel? It's kind of the same thing. You know, there's times you just want him to take the wheel. But I'm telling you, it's, life's a lot better if you just become a passenger and let him go ahead and have the wheel. It's a lot less work on us, and it's a lot more peaceful. It's a lot more <coughs> rest. If we just trust him, he'll steer us where we need to go. And he'll help us get the work done that he needs us to do. You see how it connects? Why he used the yoke as a display to help us understand. Help us understand how he works with <coughs> us. He'll steer us where we need to go. And um, afterwards... We won't just be worn out. That's a good thought, right? If we're doing the Lord's work that we won't become so weary that we'll stop doing good. I think I've heard that somewhere else before too, right? Don't get weary in doing good. Well, we won't if we allow him to do what he does and that we understand that yes, we're the worker bees and he's the king bee, okay? We understand that. We can benefit from our partnership with God. I think that's another thing we have a hard time grasping is that the creator of the universe wants us to be his partner in partnership with him. Yes, he could do it all by himself, but see, he doesn't want it to be that way. He wants us to help. You know why? When you, were, when you had little kids and you said, you know, hey, you know, Papa says, come over here. I want you to hammer this nail in with me, right? How does that feel? 
you feel like a big man when you get to go over there and help dad or papa hammer that nail in. When you, when you ask your kids to help with something, it makes them feel great. It makes them feel involved. Guess what? That's what God thinks when he asks us to do something. So when you know that feeling and feel that feeling that you need to help someone, you need to do something, or you ask somebody to help you do something good, it makes them feel great too. That's another lesson from the yoke. We don't have to do this stuff alone. Rarely is there a yoke for one. Right? Rarely is the yoke for just one. We can benefit from our partnership with God and reach the lost and the unsaved. Not because we used our own power, but because he added in his. The beauty of coming to Jesus every day is taught right here in this passage. When we take on his yoke, his leadership, his leading, his power, his wisdom, then we will spend our entire lives learning from him. You see, it's kind of like he's asked us to be an apprentice. To be his apprentice, to learn from him so we can learn better how to reach the lost and unsaved, how we can better help people and impact our neighborhoods, our street, our city, our town, our village, our whatever we live in, our neighborhood, our state, our country, our world. By learning from him, he takes us to a special place though. And sometimes it takes a while to get there. But by learning from him, coming to him, spending time with him, we will, he will take us to that place, that very, very special place where we get rest for our souls. A place beyond physical rest. Even a place beyond <clears throat> mental rest place to where we will find rest in our very souls. The truth is, some of these burdens that we feel so weighted down by, these things that we carry along with us are actually made about trying to do too much on our own. It's true. Every time we throw another burden on our back, it slows us down. We move forward slower. Jesus, and the less rest we have in our souls and our bodies. Every time you toss another burden up there on your shoulder, on your back, and you don't get rid of something that's up there, the longer it takes to get to that place where your soul can find rest. We are created <coughs> to give him our burdens. We are created to give him our worries. It's very important that we learn how to do that. The truth is, though, faith is required to do this, isn't it? To give your burdens, to give your weariness away to him requires faith. Even if it's just a little bit of faith, the faith of a mustard seed. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, you understand why God used a mustard seed as an example of how much faith it takes to do anything. They're the little tiniest seeds, but then they grow into the biggest plants you've ever seen. It's amazing. It's a God thing. But if we just had the mustard seed of faith to get started, then 
we will find Jesus gentle and humble in the way he deals with us. Somewhere along the way, I think we got um, bamboozled with the thought of God being so angry at us all the time that he's always waiting for a good opportunity to smite us, to punish us, to call us down, to make us feel badly about ourselves. But I don't know about you, but I've not found that to be the God that I serve at all. Not at all. In fact, the God that I have found, that I serve, that I trust, that I worship, that I read about, that I sing about, and the Savior that I know is not like that at all. He's very much more like this, humble and gentle in the way he deals with me. As I learn, and I'm learning, believe me, he is gentle and he is humble. So the truth is, don't expect gentleness or humbleness from this world. This world will not give you that. That is not the world we live in. This is not a gentle or humble world that we live in. Our world does not operate that way. Expecting to find peace, expecting to find rest or gentleness or humbleness in this world will only lead to more weary days and more burdens on your back. I, I can't guarantee a lot, but I can guarantee that. If you're expecting that from other people, you're most likely going to be disappointed, even by sometimes by the people you love the most. That's why God is God. That's why he is the epitome, the definition of humble and gentle. Just because something, someone is so powerful doesn't mean they can't be humble and gentle too. God's the epitome of that. The world and trying to find happiness or rest in this world will only lead to more weary days and more heavy burdens. Just look at those people around us trying to fill those voids with things like drugs or alcohol, toxic relationships, money, attention, and self. Just, just look at the people around us and what, where they find themselves when they're trying to fill those voids with things like that. What you see around you as weary and burdened people. There's an old song. There's an old song by Johnny Lee. Anybody know what song I'm talking about? This is an old one, oldish. For some of us, it's oldish. For some of us, it's old. For Johnny Lee, it's called Looking for Love. Remember uh, Urban Cowboy? Remember the movie Ur Urban Cowboy? You know, and there's a song in, uh, in that movie called Looking for Love. You remember it? Now, this is, this is the first, first couple of lines of it. Well, I spent a lifetime looking for you. Single bars and good time lovers were never true. Playing a fool's game, hoping to win and telling those sweet lies and losing again. And then the chorus, first part of the chorus says, I was looking for love in all the wrong places. Looking for love in too many faces, searching their eyes, looking for traces for what I'm dreaming of. Remember that song? You're welcome. You'll be singing that all day long, right? <laughs> it's a catchy song. You, you, catch, you catch on, you start singing it, you'll sing it all day. But that is a very worldly view of where you're trying to find love, Right? We agree. Why is he not finding love? Because he's not looking in the right places. What he's dreaming of is peace and rest and joy and laughter and happiness. And for a lot of us 
here in this room, we know there's only one real source of that. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our God, Jehovah. That's where it really, really comes from. It's great to have a great spouse. It's awesome. It's awesome to have a best friend that you know you can count on, that take a bullet for you. That's awesome. It's great to have great parents that you know are always going to be there for you. That is great. That's awesome. We all need that. Not everybody has that. But it's great if you have those things. But if you truly want to find what you're dreaming of, look no further than Jesus. Mm -hmm. If you want to find what you're dreaming of, look no further than Jesus. You see, Jesus is calling each and every one of us to come to him. And this goes far beyond him calling us to salvation. Believers, please, don't stop there. Don't just stop with your salvation. As important as that is, there's more work to do. There's more to do. And there's more great and wonderful things to be had in the life of following Jesus than just being saved. He's calling us to come into a lifetime of learning and love and relationship with him. When we come to him. So I know it may have felt like we did things a little out of order this morning, but there was a purpose and a plan in that too that God had for it. So he's saying come to him. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to pray and I'm going to bless communion, which is a time for us to come to him. And to have a quiet moment with him and listen to him. And, and we can talk to him. It's a great time to say, you know, God, I've, I've got this stuff here in this boat with me. And I want to try to get out of the boat today. I want to try to walk on the water with you today. I want to try to have that childlike faith, more of that today. And God, I want to get rid of some of these burdens. God, I'm so tired of dealing with stuff. Can I please get rid of that and get out of the boat, take your hand, and walk on the water with you today? The best way we can start that is to take that little cup, that little wafer, and remember <clears throat> why this is all possible for us. By coming to the table with him and saying, I'm coming to you here at this table with this cup that represents your body and blood. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, help us to come to you each and every day every minute of every day that we'll learn to be in presence with you. The Father God, we would have the courage to get out of our boats, to walk on the water with you and have faith that you'll keep us afloat. Lord Jesus, we're just so thankful. Be with everybody on our prayer list. Lord Jesus, all the hurting, all the sick, all the lonely and anxious and fearful, everyone out there, Father God, that finds themselves weary and burdened. Lord Jesus, we call out to them for, to go to you. And you called out to them, come to me. Lord Jesus, Father God, the first three words of our passage today say it all. You want us. You like us. You love us. And you want us in your life. Lord Jesus, Father God, as we drink the cup of juice, whatever we're drinking, Father God, we remember your blood spilled and shed for us and for this cleansing of our sins and the sins of many, many others. Lord Jesus, we, as we take the wafer, the cracker, whatever we're having, Lord Jesus, that represents your body to recall was broken for us. You didn't have to. You chose to. Father God, today we choose to come to you. 
We praise you and we thank you. In your almighty holy name we pray. Amen. So as we leave here today, leave here in the direction of Jesus. And think about this. Am I ready to get out of the boat? Have childlike faith with Jesus? And to get rid of these burdens that I've carried around, maybe for years, maybe for a lifetime. And, and go to him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, as we go from here, help us remember you're here for us. You want us to come to you. It's the way you designed us. You created us to come to you. So Father God, Lord Jesus, if we, if we ever wonder why we don't have peace, why we never seem to have enough rest, why our minds seem so troubled, Maybe we just need to remember to go to you first. Father God, to lay things at your feet, get out of the boat and walk on the water with you. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you love us that much. You love us this much to be so intimately involved in our lives that you want us to have rest. You want us to have joy. You want us to have peace. And that, Father God, you've made a way to have all those things, even in this world. Father God, keep us, keep our minds and eyes on you, Lord Jesus, as we go out and go about. We love you, Father God, and we love each other. Thank you for this body. Father God, continue to lead us to what you want us to do, how you want us to operate in the things, Father God, that we can do to impact the world around us. In your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. And I'll see you real soon.